Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We are sitting here with a rather lovely and very patient Mr. Rob Moose. We've had some uh, technical issues, so he's been hanging around for about an hour now. So thank you, Rob, for being so patient. I must say that's a rather lovely looking studio. You've told me what, you're, you're off the coast of Washington State on, a, on an yeah. island? Yes. Yeah, it's called Orcas Island. It's uh, it's quite close to the Canadian border. It's near Vancouver Island. I've been I've been visiting here and occasionally making music here for about a dozen years, and had the opportunity to get a house here like five years ago. And during we renovated, and then we decided to come here for like a family sabbatical. And there was an old carport here that we converted into a recording studio, and it just finished like a month and a half ago. And so I've between different travels I've done, I've really only been in here for like 10 days total. And so it's kind of wow. empty, a very exciting space for me because I've never had a real recording studio before. Your credits are insane. I, I, I feel like I've got a lot of credits. I've got a good four or 500 all, all, on all music, but I click over to you and you've got 1,085 just to sit on all music, which we know usually only has about half of our credits. So you're a busy person to say the least. You've worked on and you continue to work on many, many albums for many, many years now on so many records I know. So if you didn't have your own studio, what were you doing? Were you just kind of renting spaces or, or just making it work wherever you were? I think, I think for about the past like nine years or so, I've had, I've had a space that's, that's constituted a studio, but I've never, um, I've never had like a properly fully treated or, or certainly not like kind of con custom constructed thing you know when i like when i got into playing on on records as opposed to in addition to just touring um i had no idea how big a, a part of my career it was going to become so um i've always been kind of cautious about about uh stepping into new circumstances uh, i'm not the type of person that would just instantly kind of like buy all the best stuff and um i thought really that recording myself and and doing sessions was going to be like a sort of a writing process or a demoing process and i just kind of came up still in this in the more conventional studio system of being brought in and and um slowly over time realized that people were just finding it incredibly convenient to receive recorded string arrangements without having to kind of interrupt what they were doing you know like they're they could be doing drums that day and or something and just magically receive these files so um so yeah it, it wasn't until this last year that that i really felt like uh the space existed and that it, it made sense with what i was doing to you know to make the investment and um so excited uh, uh to have it now give us uh, a little um for the for the geeky members of the community which would also include me um give us a sort of rundown of of, of your gear because from what i've heard and obviously so many of your arrangements are uh Pretty well known, um, to say the least. You're doing, you can do some full blown, it's not just a single violin part. You're doing full arrangements and playing every, every instrument in that arrangement. Are you, how do you do it? Do you do, do you set up like as a quartet and have room mics going and then move around and have individually mic'd? Is there, a, I know that seems to be one process I've heard people do. Yeah. Um, I've done it a lot of different ways. I when I've, when I've gone into real studios, um, uh, and worked with, with engineers, I've, I've, I've done more of that kind of hopping around as, um, yeah, I think it's great. And to be getting those, those different perspectives and, um, what recording myself, uh, which is what I mostly do now, I'm a little bit more, you know, dependent on the, the production process to kind of make some of that come to life. I use a lot of different instruments. I use a combination of, of mics. So I, like when I'm, when I'm layering, I don't want to give away all my special sauce, but you know, when I'm, <laughs> when I'm stuff up, I, I will, I will like each pass will have a different combination of like instrument and bow and microphone and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, I mean, what I, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not really trying to like fully mimic. I think it's impossible to really mimic, uh, to even compete with like the sound of a, a proper section in a, in a room, you know, like you get even. 15 players playing one note in a beautiful space it's just like heaven you know on the room mic but i i feel like what i'm doing is you know trying to provide like layering and depth and stuff but it's also it's unified by the fact that a single person is playing it 
which could be a limitation, but I think also allows it to be a different type of thing. Like there's a, you know, there's diversity in the sound with how I'm varying uh, what I'm playing and what I'm playing it on. But there's also this like one kind of aesthetic guide and something that kind of holds it all together. And I think it gives it a certain sound that's an alternative, you know, not a replacement, just an alternative. So um, I use, I use a, there's a, a Soyuz condenser I use and a, um, uh, and uh, a Royer 122. And, um, and I'm just, I'm just using like Neve in the box, you know, Apollo, uh, you know, and UA stuff. Um, right now with this studio, I hope to collect proper gear and like up my, uh, another mic I've, in, I've enjoyed using in the past, but it's, I need to get fixed up a little bit is my, um, an AEA R88. Um, of, and with that one, you know, I love being able to kind of just move, move where I am, or even I've done, and you could probably tell me this is completely wrong. But I've just even just like <laughs> from pass to pass so that I'm it, I'm not changing where I am in the room, but I'm sort of changing where I am in relationship to the microphone. I'm just doing this all by feel. I don't I haven't I never trained as an engineer or anything. So something that my friend L- Lenise Ben told me um, a few years ago, she was uh, uh, the assistant engineer on Asia, you know, Steely Dan. And I assumed that the drums and being stilly Dan, that it was going to be, you know, everything individually mic'd and just like, you know, a hundred mics, something crazy like that, 20 mics on the kit. She said it was four. She said for Bernard Purdy in particular, four mics, kick snare overheads. And I was like, wow, how did you get those overheads to be in phase and pick up all the toms? She goes, we let him set them up. Oh, wow. So I think that speaks exactly to what you're saying because you've got the headphones on, you're recording, you move it around so it sounds good to you. And she said, the drummer, Bernard Purdy, was thinking, well, you know, the cymbal's a bit too hot, Tom's not loud enough, so he'll adjust his playing and move the mic to get a a better balance. So I I feel like, you know, they say the beauty's in the eye of the beholder, I suppose it's also in in the ear of the beholder. And you are getting the sound that you want. And obviously it's working, you know, you've got a thousand plus credits on all music for string arrangements and string playing. So, you, you know, for all of the guys and girls I know doing this, you're, you must be considered one of the most successful out there. So whatever you're doing is right. I think we, we're, we're here to sort of mine you and find out how you're doing it. And I, I like hearing a little bit of a punk rock aesthetic because it does put it back to the playing, the performance, and of course the parts that you've written. Um, and that's why, you know, I find more exciting sometimes. As much as I'm an engineer, I also like reminding ourselves that, you know, it does start with great music. Yeah, I, I think one something that keeps me really honest is is um these uh is super basic headphones that I use. Um seventy five oh sixes, the Sony. Yeah, you know, I just I think those are just the headphones that I most frequently would find in studios when I was getting started doing this stuff. And I got used to the way they sounded, which is not flattering for st- string instruments. Um, but, you know, uh, I, it, it just helps me. The consistency of using the same headphone just helps me with my, like, I feel like monitoring is kind of everything. Being really strict about your monitoring, like, especially like realizing what you don't need to hear when, you, when you're tracking the string arrangement. Not conceiving of it, but, you know, like, I, I think sometimes when I'll have other people add on to what I've done, I can sort of tell if, if I feel like they're hearing way too much of the vocal and not focusing on this aspect of the string thing that they're supposed to interact with or something. But but anyway, those headphones, you know, they're so kind of like harsh and bright, which helps me hear myself and match myself. Um, but I figure if 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 I can like live with or even enjoy the arrangement I've recorded while listening back on those those headphones, like I'm in a pretty good place, you know, because it's going to automatically sound so much better on real speakers and and i i don't want to be seduced by by the sonics of what i'm doing while i'm doing it i really want it to be like you know like almost like the worst possible version and sure. and for me to still love it so that's kind of i think that's that's something that helps me in a way even if it tortures me during the process it just makes it makes perfect sense because you know growing up in the uk and in europe we all had a uh, biodynamic dt100s which are those sort of in fact we were at abbey road a couple of weeks ago and there was like a, a, a string section had been in or was about to be in and there was like 200 pairs of these horrible headphones that i i grew up loving and of course ns10s you know are 
horrific in the mid-range. Um, there is definitely, I've heard many of us say over the years, if you can get it sounding good on those, it will sound good on anything. Um, so whether that's a, a, a truth or not, I don't know, but I do know that I, I, I relate to what you're, you're, you're talking about. Um, if it's too flattering and too perfect. Should I buy NS10s as my, uh, my speaker equivalent of, my, of what I'm used to headphone wise? <laughs> well, what are you used to on speakers? What do you normally use? Just like not, not very big, like 8030 Gentil X or something. I, you know, oh, there's a lovely, yeah. Bill Room is like such a new thing for me that I'm kind of having to buy everything from scratch. So um, right. it's going to be thing, like the idea of kind of scaling up without losing, without losing what you're used to, you know, the good things about what you're used to. You're working with a really amazingly diverse, look at my notes here, you know, a lot, a lot of cool indie stuff, which I suppose all connects together um, and makes some sense. But then, you know, you're, you're in the pop world as well, obviously with Taylor right. Swift. And then you're in some of the rock worlds, like I see some recently Eddie Vedder. You're moving all over the place, which is very impressive. You know, when I started doing this, my, my goal was to just try to kind of, I don't know if democratize is the right word, but I, it's a good word. I always democratize like i I always kind of bristled against the idea that people would be intimidated by using strings like i you know i grew up um i started playing violin when i was six years old i passionately loved the violin as a kid i didn't know it wasn't maybe conventionally cool to like love the violin you know uh, and i just worshipped like the classic you know yasha heifetz and the amazing soloists of the past playing tchaikovsky concerto and things like that and then but i also grew up listening to alternative rock radio and like you know my first the first albums that i owned were like alice in chains and nirvana and metallica and like i'm a kid of the 90s so there was great music on the radio and and like interesting harmonic expressions and stuff that like you know even caught my ear even though i was used to this like very sophisticated music so to me when i when i started working with bands and you know it's a kind of a long story to get from being six to what i'm doing now but but um (laughs) I just really wanted to uh, be able to to offer this service to people where it's like, it's not a big deal to have strings on your record, you know, like it yep. doesn't have to be a stressful thing where you have to hire a million people and like somebody's going to look down on you and judge you and you're going to feel intimidated. Like, I'm just not interested in that. Like, you know, I, I went to school for classical music. I hang in that world. I, I have a contemporary music group um, and, and attitudes have, relaxed and opened a lot you know in the last decade or two but um it was really important to me to kind of make it as easy as like hiring a a guitar player speak a little bit about your journey um you're six you love the violin um which music school did you end up going to as when you were in your teens presumably i studied privately i started on piano picked up violin a year later and um and then uh, went to manhattan school of music for my undergrad so that, that got me to, I grew up in the Northeast, but that got me to New York City. And uh, it was an amazing time to be there. I'm sure it's, you know, still a good time to be there. But, um, but I feel like there was something going on between, with the use of orchestral instruments in non-classical situations and an interesting venues that we sort of take for granted more now, like, you know, that you would, that you would see a string quartet and it'd be amplified and it would, wouldn't be, there'd be no proscenium and stuff. But but in like, you know, 2001, 2002, like that was, that was, I feel like relatively new and it blew my mind as a young classical instrumentalist to see people, uh, amplifying violins and improvising and, you know, and, and just being able to perform at a high level, but for an audience that, that might scream in the middle of a song or be having a drink <laughs> or like not looking at a program book. And I felt like there was this possibility to kind of bring the worlds of my musical interests together, you know, um, it took me a long time to do it. I ended up kind of pursuing playing guitar and being bands that way, because that made more sense to me. I didn't, I didn't understand right away that you could like do the thing that you're good at. That wasn't necessarily historically represented in a band and, and just be in a band. It took, it took, it was kind of a circular path, but I think New York really exposed me to lots of cool live music that opened up the way I thought about my own instrument. Do you feel like with the amplified stuff, um, and this is this is an opinion, so you can completely disagree. Uh, some of the amplified stuff, when it gets too electric, starts going. Oh, whether is that, is that a solo electric guitar or is it? Oh no, it's a violin. 
uh, you know, some of the things that I find so remarkable about a violin and so idiosyncratic of it can get lost once it starts going through five, you know, guitar pedals and into an amp. Um, totally. Yeah. I mean, I, Yellow Card was probably a great example in the late 90s, early 2000s of a band with a violin that was successful, like an emo rock band. But I didn't see thousands of violin players joining emo bands as a, right. as a result of them. Yeah, I think I didn't even mean like um, electric violin so much as just even just like a on mic or a or a you know right. yeah what, yeah if, you know this just the idea of it going through a PA um, somehow that just was very exciting to me to see because I just I didn't know that existed and and um, and yeah so I I was like you know doing this violin degree um, by day sort of and 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 trying to play in different bands guitar and violin and and back then like craigslist was was sort of you know what social media is now sort of sure and uh so i ended up playing in this group for a long time called my brightest diamond and it, it was like a you know a rock trio with a string quartet and we would play these little gigs like cb's gallery bowery poetry club like i would get like four dollars at the end of the night you know um but that <laughs> and amazing and somebody that i still hope to keep working with her name's Sharon Nova. Um, she led me to working with uh, Anthony and the Johnson, Sufjan Stevens, The National, which led to like Bon Iver. Basically everything I've done has kind of come in some way from answering this Craigslist ad. So you've worked with some legends as well. Um, I couldn't help notice obviously uh, both um, Linda Thompson. Um, oh and, yeah. And uh, uh, Marion Faithful. Yeah. Linda Thompson was like, I think one of my very first recording sessions, I actually played guitar on this song that Rufus Wainwright had written for her. And my God, what a voice. Like I was, you know, I was still pretty young, but I, I was a fan of, of her, her singing and the, the Richard and Linda stuff. And, and so it was like such an honor to get to do that. I remember being so nervous and uh, Mary and Faithful, my God, like that was cool because we were really tracking live. Like Mark Rebo was playing guitar and we were in like a booth maybe at Sear Sound or something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just getting to encounter people like that when you're in your early or mid-20s, it's like, even if it's not, even if I didn't make the biggest contribution to those recordings, I think just being in space with people like that is, you know, you can't underestimate the impact of that. There's two, there's two elements to a transition which I think would be really useful in a conversation, and that is obviously the first transition that you're discussing where you want to be more available, you were saying you were challenging yourself to how much different, how many different artists, how many different songs can you work with? Um, yeah. And I love that. But I also think there's another part of it as well. If you could speak to both of these elements, where you go from being the guy that's hired to add some violin to yeah. the guy that's hired to do an arrangement. So, so in like the mid 2000s, I started touring with a couple different indie groups, Anthony the Johnson, Sufjan Stevens, later the National. And um, these groups, in, in a lot of them, there would either be one person in the group who kind of, you know, maybe studied an instrument when they were a kid, a, a classical instrument and had a little bit of a background and could write down an idea or something. And so there would be often somebody or the singer themselves, but I, I, was, I was able to usually kind of assist in kind of um, notating and maybe explaining Banning the idea, but that was kind of how I got my feet wet doing arrangements. Um, but then gradually there, there just seemed to be opportunities, you know, you stick around long enough, somebody doesn't get something done, whatever it is. Um, I got the chance to kind of write my own charts for the first time. And, um, and the amazing thing about that, which just seems so weird now looking back is like, I didn't know what it was going to sound like until we did it, which is, you know, now we can just demo everything to within an inch of its life but um so that was a transition that happened for me over the course of like five years and and that's when i really I, I just got so much so excited about um you know being a part of the creative process i think i always i always admired like the guitar player and the drummer and the bass player because they were like making music together in a in a in a way that felt similar to like chamber music but in this rock band setting and as a street player you're often kind of like you're over on the side and like you know, it might look good uh, in, in the video or something, but like, are you really <laughs> of the creative process? I, I, I desired that. So getting a chance to write the arrangement was like another step closer to like kind of feeling like you're in the band and making it happen. So 
that really pushed me when I started to get those experiences to, to, to seek that as much as possible and to try to simplify it for anybody who might want to add that to their music. Um, or even to pitch it to people like you should, your music deserves this, you know, like, um, and it's, it's funny that these, these bands and singers who are like, you know, so well known, um, maybe they weren't quite at the time, but there's still like kind of a prestige thing to string instruments, classical music, whatever, where they, they, that was validating to hear. And the fact that someone like me wanted to thought the music was worth adding these elements to meant something and they were willing to pursue it. And that was kind of in the air at that time, I think, to be experimenting with that stuff. I try to take like a very blue collar approach to what I do. I feel like it's, mm, I understand. I think of myself kind of like a plumber or something, you know, it's like. In the UK, we call it jobbing. Like yeah. people, people say to, I say, I always tell people I was a jobbing, I'm a jobbing producer. Like I got to work with some really big artists. I got to have like a James Blunt credit as a producer, but then the other five artists, either side of James were local or independent or signed to indie labels. Um, so every megastar, there's five that aren't. And I, I, I feel like there's beauty in that, isn't there? Absolutely. You know, just like honing the craft, loving it. And, uh, yeah, for, for me, I mean, I, I'm always just listening to the song and, and trying to trying to determine if I, if I have a clear sense of where I am in the song, what, right. you know, like how I could, how I could potentially clarify like the structure of the song or make us make something more impactful, even by exiting at a particular moment, you know, it's huh. like, I just, I just love, I love songs. I'm, I'm trying to help, you know, um, shed light on like what, what the intention is of the writer. Now, uh, from a production standpoint, um, the string arrangers I've always got on, got on best with, uh, uh, make bold moves, um, like add melody that really adds something to it. Um, know the really obvious things to do and when to do them and right. then know when to break the rules. Um, and I know that all sounds really, really straightforward, but I'm sure, you know, all those obvious straightforward things don't always happen. Sometimes people send me things and I'm just like, why did you choose not to support the chords there where there would have been the logical thing to do to bring forward that melody? Why did you not use the counter melody there where it was really obvious it could have benefited from it? Um, do you think, um, I mean, obviously you're successful in that realm. Do you attribute that to anything? Did you study other people's like pop indie kind of arrangements or was it something that you just borrowed from your knowledge of classical music? I was always really into transcribing. Um, I really in college, even in high school, I think uh, at some point I, when I really got the the music bug, I just thought, you know, we're transcribing all of Kind of Blue, every single solo, just like in this little notebook and Amazing. stuff like that, and and um, all kinds of things I would do way outside of String Realm, but also in String Realm. Back here on Orcas Island, when I used to come just as like creative retreat, um, I remember there was one time I was here and I spent the whole week writing writing out to the best of my ability, you know. Beatles arrangements, uh, Motown stuff, like just, just to have done it. I don't ever reference it, but I know that it's back there, you know, like the song, something It's just one of the best string arrangements ever. And it's I like, I, I wouldn't even know how to, I know I would know how to literally mimic it, but the impact that it has, the way it was played, the way it was recorded, like it was just incredible to kind of like be able to parse out what the notes were uh -huh. and realize in some ways how small of a part of it that really was but um yeah so i i've definitely studied other people's stuff um but i i think that uh in some in some senses i don't really know how to do the conventional normal thing like a, a string arrangement that sounds like it was generated by playing key, uh, keyboard you know the sort of four voice thing where it's organy like i I feel like somebody else should do that if that's what you want. Like that's not something that I I need to specifically bring to the table. I have my own ways of doing things that are more static, that are in a different register and like kind of laid out differently. But I, I hear songs and I I think you could do that thing there, but I just sort of I don't feel like that would be me being me. So I spend a lot of time just singing along, seeing if I if there's a count yeah that kind of comes to me that feels like it's it's secondary but is going to be memorable or is going to help or provide contrast that uh, i really i feel like when things click for me is when i realized that what i should do is just 
sing along a bunch and see if, a, if an idea that accidentally came out is, is worth keeping. One thing I think, um, we could go on maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I'm going to enjoy this tangent. I'm sure you will as well. Is that I think what a lot of modern, um, musicians don't realize that classical arrangements weren't written around chords. They were right. like when Mozart was writing, it was all horizontal. Everything is horizontal. Yeah. It's a melody. And then it's a line that works with that melody, maybe another counter melody, but they're all horizontal things. They're not like A major, B minor, D major, G minor, G major. You know, it's not. It, so it, with that in mind, it, it, it's, it's a much larger sonic landscape. Because you might be playing, in it. you might be at one stage in it, playing a melody on a, an E, but you, you've got infinite possibilities what you could do with it. And uh, that's one thing that I love when I hear a great string arrangement. And I love about your stuff is that I do hear that classical way of thinking. Um, you know, it's I almost grew up like motet oriented, you know, where you're, you're thinking, yeah. counterpoint, like, yeah, you're, the, the lines are interacting with each other, but they're, they're yeah, they're like, serpentine as they as they move forward too um and and sometimes in direct conversation with the vocal sometimes kind of you know and and sometimes not sometimes moving at a completely diff different rate but yeah I, I i believe strongly in that that i want each line that i'm recording to have a kind of a, a viewpoint a trajectory and its own kind of independent spirit but that it but that if you solo all my strings and the vocal it's going to sound amazing too and like you know i i i noticed i noticed that happening sometimes where you know just being in the studio when people would be checking out what i'd be doing and and they would solo the strings and leave the voice in and like sometimes that would lead to like a new track on the album or you know absolutely I, I tried to take that even further now and really make tracks that are just strings and voice as as kind of a challenge to myself but I hear it in everything you do, and I do feel like um, it's not talked about. You know, there's so many um, channels, as we know, talking about music theory and lots of mode talk and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know anybody I love and respect their work who thinks like that. They don't go, hmm, I'm going to write this in Lydian, Lydian you know, or Phrygian or whatever. It just doesn't. People, when you're writing, and you hit, you hit the nail on the head, the, the thing I love most about what you just said a minute ago was you sing melodies. And I, I, I feel like that is so instinctive to me, you know, and makes perfect sense when I'm in a room with musicians that you can, you can hear them humming along, or you can, you can see that they've got something in their head and they're finding it on their instrument. That to me is like the best because it comes from that instinctive, pure place. It's just poof. love that. I, I don't think I've ever come up with an idea that I've recorded by playing it on a violin, you know, like wonderful. It's, just, it's a different. I guess because I'm doing in a traditional sense people's jobs that when I move to the instrument I am now executing you know it's like a less it is creative because it's about how you get from one note to the other and there's millions of choices uh, and instinctual ones but I think in terms of the conception it all happens either mostly away from an instrument sometimes on a piano um, because just by being able to hear multiple you know notes at the same time but but really the voice because it's the most it's the thing i'm imitating when i'm playing anyway so i might as well get the idea from it if i could do it all again i feel like clarinet would be an instrument i would love to have studied you know it's yeah just the way that it can start from nothing and the, the the breathiness of it is um powerful but i think you'd be a little bit like uh remember the old joke about the what do you call the trombone player with a pager no, i don't know it optimistic <laughs> <laughs> I think there is something absolutely incredible about strings. Um, well, we were in uh, uh, Abbey Road a couple of weeks ago, and we, and, uh, uh, one of the owners of Spitfire Audio had um, come down and basically sampled, um, I think it was the LSO, um, in Studio 2, which of course is Eleanor Rigby. And it just has such a sound that whatever you played, you could not, not hear Eleanor Rigby. You were just like, wow. it, it, you know, because it has that, it's quite a big room studio too. I'm sure you've seen many photos and all the Beatles photos because it goes up and the, right. and the control room is like up the stairs. So, but it doesn't have a huge room sound. It yeah. has quite a tight sound 
Um, but it, but the room does impart a massive sonic, uh, um, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, stripe to it, as it were. You know, you can't remove it. And I do. I don't know. I, I I relish those kinds of things. I love individuality. I love being able to hear something and know. Oh, you know. Now that I've been listening to a bunch of your stuff, I I almost feel like I could pick your stuff out on a record. <laughs> but yeah. I think that that's a good thing. It doesn't mean that you're copying motifs or you're using the same melody or always playing, you know, a six over this chord or whatever. It, it's more than that. There's something about. Uh, but that I think is. Isn't that like when we watch a movie and we know who the director is and we love their style? You know, I definitely take it as a compliment. There's there's certain people who who will text me who aren't even musicians. They'll be like, "This is you on this track, right?" And I'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, you got me." You know, or um, lovely. But but yeah, I, I think it's I think it's interesting. I mean, each what I love about what I do is that I often get you know a new song. Not every, not every single day, but but you, usually it, it's a it's a new day. It's a new song and. And it's like this opportunity to kind of fall in love of each time. You know, so, sometimes I hear, I hear the song I'm going to do for the first time, and um, and I have I have no idea what to do or why I've said I would do it, or you know, like <laughs> I try, that's important to me is that I try to preserve the moment of first hearing or or, or some attempt at that for when <laughs> I can come up with the idea and capture it. Like <laughs> I, this thing for the hardest thing for me is is telling somebody what I'm going to do. Like if I have to pitch the idea or explain it or get on a call, if I have to get on a call to talk about the song before I'm going to do it, I basically just want to hear from the producer and the artist what they want or whether they don't know what they want or, you know, what would be the wrong thing to do? Like, give me any parameters that exist. But, um, but I, I like to maintain a, a, a sort of a mystery and the, the opportunity to discover something uh, and capture it right then because I, I think something true about that that's you know you you could replay it or you could refine the idea but like it came out that way it's it's special um so i'm kind of superstitious about about songs in that way you may have already seen it that great documentary on stanley uh kubrick kubrick who, who there's uh like i can't remember there's an art director explaining that kubrick had told him what kind of shade of blue that he wanted the background to be and this kind of like animation he had to create and he basically gave him like hawaii um the time of day the island the exact time of year you know it was like so ridiculously specific but at the end of this description he said but within those parameters you know push the boundaries <laughs> <laughs> and then and then the art director is asked well how what, what well, how did the work come out and the art director says the best work i've ever done in my life <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people that I don't I don't need any information from them um, because this is what I do and what I love to do. Sure, but information exists. Don't withhold it from me because you think right. you're help. You know, because the worst thing is like anything that has a has a um, an arc to it. So if I if I choose to come in in the second chorus, build something toward the end of the song, and somebody says, "Yeah, I really wish you'd come in at the second verse," it's like if I now have to go back and have kind of retrofit that. I have probably entered in the second pre in a way that allows for more room at the chorus and a you know a change of register at the bridge and whatever, just saying stuff. But like, if I then have to go back and kind of shoe in something at the second verse, there's a chance that I've I will be, you know, not not ruining, but like I'll be I might be showing my cards earlier yeah. than it'll change the, the whole shape of the thing. So so I like to give people the opportunity to tell me that, and sometimes I have these calls that are basically just people being like thinking they have to tell me a bunch of stuff and so it's it's kind of it's you know in a perfect world I, I would be allowed to just swing for the fences and then have somebody check it out and spend some time with it because obviously i've spent a lot of time with it i think mm -hmm. it can be hard to receive no idea when they also have demoitis and then they're just like what oh. there's a melt all of a sudden and you know um but but i feel like you know 70 percent of the time i just get like a thank you so much you're we're good and, you know, 25% of the time there's like, can you just add this one thing here or change this one note? And, and then 5% of the time, I feel like it just totally doesn't work out, you know? And like, um, and that's, that's okay too. And that's something that's newer for me as I've done a greater volume of songs in a given year and worked with a wider variety of people. Like sometimes it's just not going to be 
the right fit. And I sort of appreciate that somebody's not going to like beat it to death and water it down. It might just be like, and eh, maybe we don't want strings on the song or, or something, you know. But I feel like we have to be empowered to really go for it is is so important. I cannot express how much work you've done here and how many varied artists you've worked with. So, I mean, what are moments um, we you expressed sort of early on? Um, you know, getting to work with some huge legacy artists, but also you, you're really early on working with very, very current artists. So like we said, you know, um, back in 2008, the Walkman were a big deal. So that's, that's a pretty early, um, gig to be stuck in on to say the least. And, um, uh, Anthony, the Johnsons were definitely a very hit band that everybody was talking about in that period. I mean, you, these, these, these are great credits. I mean, it's a real building block of, um, you know, career arc, uh, Arcade Fire, 2010. That's huge. And as you said, Bon Iver, um, also absolutely massive. Oh, wow. Elysian Fields. I haven't seen that name in a while. You did some stuff with Elysian Fields. Yeah, they're great. Like n classic New York group. You know, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't, like I was really properly in the band and seeing the Johnsons. That was the first I, you know, I auditioned to do a tour when I was in, I was in grad school and, uh, Amazing. and went, went on this van tour. And then, and then like later the group was nominated for the Mercury prize. I didn't, I hadn't played on that album, but I did all the touring for it. And we went, played the Mercury prize, won the Mercury prize, you know, did Jules Holland, did news, Be news night. Like we did all this, we were in the UK a lot and, and then Europe. And it was an incredible experience because I started touring in that group playing mostly guitar and then some violin well, i was 22 and congrats and continue, continue to work with anoni now and like i really consider her to be like one of my you know my primary like adult musical teacher like i, I learned so mm -hmm. much of applying my kind of chamber music background in the way that um in in this world and you know anything from a, 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 an idiosyncratic but deeply expressed sense of melody textural intrigue sense of timing and space and you know so much taste stuff came from being in that group and uh i i feel like uh, there's there's like a there's a new record coming out maybe this summer i'm not sure exactly when and it was so incredible for me to get to to do strings on on the new on the new record because it was like such a full circle i had never done like remote recording work you know for yeah. the artist really kind of taught me so much and so 15 years or 17 years later, whatever it is to, to get to play on those songs and like be the person that I am because of that group and get to share that back with the group. Incredible moment for me. So I suppose things that, that sort of jump out outside of the indie world are John Legend. Uh -huh. Um, how, how did that come about? I've gotten to work with John Legend a couple of times. One time was on, uh, uh, what's the record that the earlier one, like the 2013 thing, like it was a huge song, I think. Uh, Love in the future. Yeah, I think they were redoing strings that they had recorded in L.A. and they uh -huh. put together a New York string section and we played the chart. And um, so that was just kind of like me being a, you know, a violin player. But then uh, a few years later, in I think 2016, Blake Mills was uh, producing the album that became Darkness and Light. And I had worked with Blake on a number of projects, his, his own Alabama Shakes, Jim James, uh, I don't, you know, Laura Marling, Perfume Genius tons of different records and and so it kind of every time he had a record he would bring me out for a couple of days and just throw strings at the wall and that one was really cool because he was bringing in all kinds of you know co-writers that were foreign to, to john's world and um i got i met pino paladino and chris dave where they were the rhythm section and like wow i was a, the tracking and i just was blown away by how they were doing it because they were they would play the song like four times in a row like for 20 minutes and then they'd find areas that they really liked the interaction and they would kind of build the form out of that. And this was, and then John would come in later and sing to it. And, and so I felt like, uh, what was special about that process was, you know, encountering those musicians, seeing their, how they worked, being there while the stuff was getting made and terminating the, the string ideas and then coming back like a month later and recording that, that was all at East West, uh, studio too. But, um, yeah, that was probably the first, like, you know, very, maybe one of the early, first, like, very famous people I worked with in person. Two, two of my favorite things I've gotten to work on have that what I did or either the, the project itself or what I did didn't end up coming out. One was with Doc, an incredible day I spent with Dr. Dre 
in like, I don't know, 2015. And then I did a bunch of work on with Jay-Z as well for, for his last record that they ended up not using. But getting to spend time with those people and uh-huh. even even sometimes like the, the failures, like if they, if they get to be with people like that are just memorable, you know. Something I was going to touch on earlier, because you made a comment, um, y- you know, uh, uh, alluding probably to these recordings about, you know, how you don't always know where the stuff is going to be used. And I think that that's a reality when you work with some of the bigger artists, or at least with bigger budgets, of, uh, there's a level of experimentation. Uh, yeah. We're like, maybe this song will be good with some strings. I don't know. Let's try it out. It doesn't always mean that it will be better with strings, regardless of your string arrangement. It just might be yeah. something they're trying. So I, I, and you know, that's the beauty of having a budget where you can, you know, um, hire somebody of your caliber and and be able to choose whether they want to use it or not. Yeah, I'm still not used to that, you know, because like I said, I <laughs> I came in, in in more of an indie place and really wanting to make it sure. available, but he, you know, so much bang for their buck. So, um, and do, and it's also hard because I I really do, you know, fall in love with the. The, the piece of music, not my piece of music, you know, and really go deep on it. If it doesn't get used, it's, yep. it's, it's have a relationship with it. Here's a dumb question that I think so many of us would want to ask an arranger. Now, you take um, a very simple piano vocal piece that might even be block chords or at the very most an arpeggiation and add something which is incredibly like another counter line let's say another hook in theory you know that's still just an arrangement now let's just say you know it's not songwriting it's just an arrangement but let's say they don't use it what happens are you able to take that maybe that melody you that you wrote over that particular chord sequence and reuse it uh, or do you stay away from that uh, possibility? <laughs> Never tried to literally do that because uh, everything is so crafted for that song, that tempo, that right, vocal melody. Right. But what I have done is um, go, especially since I started recording myself and I have the stems, I've gone back to things that didn't come out or or, or, were, or sections were muted and tried to see if listening to it on its own, if it could be the start of a new idea. Um, right, right, right go play guitar too or something. And, and I've been working on a project that's finally coming out, starting to come out monthly in April. Uh, it's April now, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, first, it's an EP that I've, uh, five tracks that I've made with, uh, each with a different guest singer that I've worked with in my, um, in my career. Uh, and the songs are brand new songs and it's only strings and voice. And, um, Sometimes they were songs that were, that uh, were sometimes uh, a couple of them were ones that I, I co-wrote with the people. But um, I've been really interested in like how much can you do with just strings and voice, but not have it sound classical. Still have have a kind of a, you know, a, a propulsive like ryth- rhythm section, implied rhythm section feel to it. And um, so so har- so going back and looking at um, string stems that didn't that sort of lost their way is can be helpful and about new pieces that could become something like that. I'm a huge Bowie fan. Now, I know that you went back, I presume this is some kind of remixing or rearranging of uh, some of his stuff, um, because it was that box set that came out, uh, was it Loving the Alien? Who brought you in on that? Was that a Tony Visconti thing, where you came in and uh, and replayed some stuff? Composer and arranger Nico Muley was... uh, that was his project, uh, or like he was, he was the one who was writing for that. And so, right. uh, a few of us who have worked with him over the years, it was a string quartet, I think just got called in to play his charts for like three songs. Um, and I think it was, it was, you know, yeah, it's pretty wild to have like a David Bowie credit, you know, that was the only one where it was like a posthumous thing, but like getting yep. to work with Paul and then Bruce Hornsby and like, yep. you know, people like, uh, I don't even know who else to, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's just those two, but, but, um, yeah, it's like at a certain point you, you kind of have to just shut off the fact that, you know, or that you might've been raised on this music, you know, and you just step into the present with it. But I'm, I'm, I'm so proud and kind of humbled to have had those experiences. 
Yeah, it's incredible. A lot of uh, working with Rufus Wainwright. Absolutely. One of the one of the best. That last record I worked on, um, Unfollow the Rules, that title track is one of my favorite string arrangements I've ever done. And um, an incredible song. And, you know, just playing strings to, when you have a voice like that, that's kind of anchoring the song. It's It really pulls pulls a lot out of, out of you. Um, and that was another one where I felt like I was really well set up to go for it. Mitchell, Mitchell Froome produced that and he really... He really had had kind of, kind of figured out what what I where I should be doing stuff and where I shouldn't, but never got in my way and never held me to any temp ideas. But really, kind of had like had a, had a, such an understanding of the songs and what they needed that it was very easy to succeed. I I presume or uh, that you also know Chris Chris Sorum, who's a good friend and oh, uh, totally <laughs> yeah we worked together on some some live concerts that were released. <laughs> This and yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's really wonderful. Do you, do you ever get out to LA and record out here? I did a day in his studio in East LA. Why? Well, I, I assume he's yeah. still at the same place. Um, he yeah, I'm actually a wonderful studio. I'm in LA a lot. Um, my wife's family is there, and uh, I used to when I was kind of you know in the 2010s. I would I would I was in LA like probably almost every month to work on something. But then started doing winters in LA to really you know focus on. Uh, you know, working on projects and developing relationships, and um, yeah, we're there. We're there often. Um, I guess a little bit less so now that people are mostly just sending me stuff to send back right. and forth. But I'm coming to LA now and working on like co- doing co-writing sessions, but with strings. I'm, that's like a newer thing for me that I'm, I'm exploring. So LA is inevitable. You know, you, you can't get it out of your system. So yeah. And what about Nashville? Is there a lot of lot of stuff going on in Nashville that you, you're involved in? I haven't really cracked that 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 scene yet. I've done like we did Alabama Shakes there. I worked on an Amos record there. Um, I've played on some, some stuff more recently with uh, artists that um, Mike Elizondo is producing. Um, but I think that that'd be a good place for me to go and spend some time as well. On like just even just from an inspiration perspective, just to witness the musicianship and everything. But yeah, I, I most of my work has kind of come from L.A. or London or. Or the randomest reaches of the earth, honestly. You know, like now that with those people up on Instagram, and if, if if the track is cool, like I, you know, again, I still have that philosophy of really wanting to bring it to the masses, even if there's all these credits that I've done. I still am the same person who wants to, uh, you know, make a song better, and also like for somebody who's making their own, making a record for the first time and saving up their own money, it's like, like I want to give them something that's gonna make them feel so special and like that they've got a shot you know and like yeah that, that's important to me so i believe understanding classical music gives you an edge in what we do melody melody like strong huge massive melodies um i don't know i mean so i think i, I i'm on a little bit of a ramble because or i wouldn't say rant but a ramble because i appreciate what you're talking about you're saying you want to bring what you do to as much to as many styles and as many people as possible. But it now makes me just think, well, how can we in the music industry encourage people to go out and discover this stuff? Some of the, the larger institutions have maybe been a little bit behind in terms of creating the, right. the ways, change of, change of ways that people listen. But, but I mean, even things like that have become way more common, like um, showing movies with, and having the orchestra play the score, you know, like stuff you're doing at the Hollywood Bowl. And like, I yeah, think, yeah. What, I really feel like it doesn't matter what what the thing is that you hear that makes you love an orchestra. Like there shouldn't be judgment around that. But like, of course, you know, whatever gets you in the door. And so I, I don't think that I don't think of that as pandering. I think that that's kind of great. Um, you know, just just to just to experience the sweep and the kind of astonishing miracle of that eighty people <laughs> doing that at that level. Um, and I, yeah. I think. I think the programming and the environment is shifting and making it more uh, comfortable for for and, and approachable for people to experience. Um, yeah, but it's I it won't won't ever be like it was. I don't I don't think you know like if, if personal uh, like a little bit of a gripe or, or something that I, I I would love to challenge is even just like the kind of the the place and the mix that strings occupy. Mm-hmm. It's so hard. Like you know, you go listen to stuff even from the 80s or you know 70s but much less uh, even even more so like obviously sinatra or something where it's like 
there wasn't really a band and the orchestra, like the orchestra was kind of like the whole thing, but, um, I'm, al- I'm always a little bit, you know, I think I'm, I'm overly optimistic about where, about how much you'll hear the strings that I might do or somebody else might do. Like I play, I, you know, I played on a number one song for the first time, the Miley Cyrus song flowers. And, you know, but by, by the second chorus or maybe the last chorus, like you can hear me like fairly well, there's only four musicians on the song. Uh, and, and, the, and the, the part is like, I feel like it's important, you know, but it's, it's just so small. And I, I don't know what that's <laughs> what about. I wish I mean, you probably have more insight into that, but, uh, that's something that I just, I just keep hoping somebody's going to, you know, if you're going to the, creating this and, you know, all that, like, can, is it possible to feature it a little bit more? Let's just do a kind of a wrap up with a, with this question. So what are you work, currently working on? You've got this brand new studio that you've built. Um, what, what, what are you working on at the moment? It's interesting when people are commenting what I've been doing and they're like, you've been so busy. They're always talking about something I did a year or two ago that, that came out now, you know, and it'd be, it'll be like five different records come out on the same Friday. So I feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm continuing to, to work on people's songs. I'm, I'm getting ready for releasing my own music for the first time. These, these five singles um, with different guest singers starting on April 21st. And, and my group, Y Music, which is a, a chamber music sextet made of strings, winds, and brass. Uh, we're releasing our first, we've been a group for like 15 years, but we're releasing for the first time music that we um, wrote together, all six of us, uh, without notation, um, in kind of like a co-writing fashion, but for chamber music. Um, that's coming out in, in May, and we're, we're getting ready to play release concerts of that. So um, after commissioning like 100 works or something over the past 15, uh, uh, 15 years, we're finally like stepping into the kind of composer, um, you know, uh, spotlight or whatever. So that's, that's very Lovely. exciting. I, I feel like, you know, between that and, and my, my personal project, just trying to kind of, uh, wear a few more hats, feel comfortable stepping into, into the center a little bit more as a result of all the, all the work I've done and, and, you know, continuing to challenge myself creatively. I, the last thing I want to do is 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 be like a a slightly less interesting version of of something I did seven years ago. So I, <laughs> challenges keeps pushing you forward and, and unlocks new ideas. So I, yeah, I like, imagine I imagine that is a fear for many people, isn't it? Because so many of our artists that we follow and we love, we we start looking as their career grows um, and they get older. It safety does seem to take over, doesn't it? Yeah, or, you know, sometimes maybe it's like a, a casting issue where people just so strongly associate you with things that you've done that mm, you get... Interesting, yeah. You know, like, I feel like the artists that I've worked with that have that people know me for are, are Bon Iver, Phoebe Bridgers, you know, and so it's like, yeah. go play on like 77 songs that are like less good Phoebe Bridgers songs. That's not necessarily going to be good, inspiring for me, good for my quote-unquote brand or, you know, so... I, I'm so appreciative that there's different stuff in front of me at all times. And, and um, I sometimes when I, when I have like seven or nine things coming up that I have to play on, I'll purposefully like sequence them in a really weird order. So it's like, it's like wh- artistic whiplash because I think, you know, if I, if I play on three songs in a row in an A minor at 76 BPM, like it's going to be harder to do something different on the third one. But if I, if I'm like jumping back and forth between like more of a disco thing and something that's like RB and something that's, Folk, you know, it, uh, hopefully I just will be so disoriented all the time that I'll always be mm-hmm. fresh. You know, all of the greatest music that we, we grew up listening to is blends of other genres. Um, yeah, I think where maybe that's another way of looking at we describing our artists getting older is that when they, the more honed in they get on something, the sa- that it does start to become a little safe. Maybe they, they can definitely, um, you know, like Picasso it always explained that, uh, his art seemed more simplistic, but it was just a lot of acquired knowledge. So right. uh, I do find the more I produce, the less I do. Um, yeah, but I'm a- able to identify something and say, oh, more of that, you know. I feel like the biggest thing I've learned from doing thousands and thousands of songs is like to trust my first instinct, you know, which uh. is again why I try to really preserve that moment because, um, you know, even if the first line that you write and that you record, even if I do seven passes of it, uh, and I find I might find something else in the second violin part where it's like, oh no, this is primary, and you can always throw that out. But like, just getting yourself engaged and in, in the process of making something, you know, I'm not starting from scratch, but 
still it can be intimidating to kind of like come up with and record that first line but you just have to get in there and and so i i really prize that sort of uh kind of immediacy and almost like euphoric rush of just dis- discovering eight measures of what i'm going to do and just immediately as, as quickly as i can getting to audio rather than my ideas or notation just getting right into like sound and responding to it the greatest songwriters i've worked with um i watched them take their melodic idea and try to match the phrasing with the lyric meaning if it's got a hard consonant they're literally you know they'll want that they'll 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 go oh okay that's that's the sound i need at the end of that that lyric and when they preserve that initial idea it's the better song so i know exactly what you mean that that instinctive melody that comes to you um quite often almost almost every time it is the it's the strongest thing you're going to come up come up with yeah that makes perfect sense especially for you because if you're doing arrangements you 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 better have a melody pretty quickly because there's a lot of actual donkey work that comes into finding things that work together you know uh, i imagine that that is a massive skill you know you've got your first melody that is the motif that's probably going to be most of the song but now you've got to create create all of these different counterpoints to create different emotional elements over different chord sequences and in, and how it affects the vocal melody that's like a lot of actual work a lighter session for me would be like 24 tracks and I'm sending, you know. Wow. And um, yeah, yeah. I wanted to have that dimension and depth and diversity of sound. And and, uh, and I'm also, I mean, I don't know if this is just me not being smart or or what, but like, I, I'm not necessarily going to use the same idea from course to course either. Like I, I really, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of like kind of just flying the, I'm not going to overly complicate it for, for the sake of doing it, but I, but I don't assume that my idea on chorus one is going to necessarily be what the same thing I'm playing on chorus three. You want it to develop. Even, yeah. yeah. Even with different accompaniment, I mean, there, it might just be like, what if there's a completely new melody that comes like, that's sick. It's not that, yeah, it's not, yeah. not going to like lose the listeners that confuse them necessarily. But so, yeah, I never know what I'm, what I'm getting myself into when I, when I come up with that first idea, like you said, I have a really high level of integrity about it. Um, so I, I try my damnedest and I, and, um, it, you know, if if at the very end I'm listening one last time and I hear one more thing, I'm go- I'm not going to be like, it's good enough. I never would do that. You know, it's got to sound good in my terrible headphones and with no <laughs> plugins on it. Like, because what are we doing this for? You know, like it's it's like it, you have to fall in love with it. I mean, I I hear song I work on like hundreds of times because of all the passes. You know, so it's like it's got to be great. A friend of mine said it in as a film director, you're only as good as your last movie. Is it? it can be different in music because so many things come out simultaneously you can be a producer that's working on multiple albums like you were just pointing out so maybe an album comes out that's that, that flopped but the album that you completed the two weeks late you know after that release is a- also comes out before everybody decides that you're the world's worst producer and comes out as a success but with movies etc um yes you know it's it's nine months of somebody's life quite often and then you know then they've bidding on the next one and talking and you know preparing for something else and it can completely destroy their career if it's if it's a big budget thing that flops and i I like that philosophy though you know only as good as your last work keeps you you know like you're saying keeps your integrity level high because you want to make sure that joe ciccarelli said it best to me he said he came up in a time in the 70s where when you put a tape up on a machine you wanted to be impressed by what you were hearing and you wanted to make sure that when you did your guitar overdubs or your drum parts or whatever and sent it to the next person that they pulled it up and went whoa who engineered this this sounds great who's the drummer you know and i i I think that's that that's the thing to be proud of I, i i like what you're saying because you want you want somebody to just be blown away want to know who did it you know right so who did that that's how you get work isn't it you know um, I don't know about you. I've never, I've loved my manager, but my manager is not spending his whole life kicking down the door, trying to get me work. My work gets me work. That's a com- completely true. And I, I'm often relieved to hear other people say it as it can be a challenging thing, you know, to, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's true. It's, you're the best spokesman for yourself in that regard. And I also, you know, in terms of like the evolution of what one does over time, I also accept that there are things that I did heard early on when i was doing strings that like 
and people might even be reference a song that I've played on space again. I'm on something else. You know, it's like, it's not like you're better or you're less good or you're, it's just like, it, it kind of keeps moving around. And, and like 2012 me might've had some idea about something that felt very fresh at the time that if I were to try to go back in there, it wouldn't feel like as honest, you know, I, I never want to be like imitating myself. So in some ways, in order to gain new skills, you can, you almost, you don't lose the other, the other ones, but there's like a limited kind of capacity. And I think hopefully, you know, you just keep chasing and, and adding stuff. And, and at the end, you're kind of a distillation of all of your best. I think you sort of said this earlier, but like you're a distillation of all of your best periods, traits, instincts. And it's kind of like simplified and very iconic in its way. Um, but it's, it's like melded together. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited as, as to be embarking on the next decade of doing this and like um, tying together the best fr from my 20s and, you know, all the, all, all the years past, all the experience, but like still trying to find the new exciting thing that I can't wait to share. So we've been dancing around this. Uh, I suppose the next logical thing is um, for you, film composition. I've worked with a lot of composers on either just, you know, playing their stuff, but also sort of improvising for them. Um, and I, I, I worked, I co-composed something. I wasn't credited because of the timing of getting hired and stuff. But um, I do have an upcoming project that's a documentary that um, uh, about a musician, a well-known musician that's, I think, going to be, if it all comes together and happens, it should be, should be a cool project that can hopefully give some visibility. I, like, I'm, I'm very interested in, in that world um, and the possibilities of, of what you can do. But I also kind of, I love records and I love that you're kind of talking to one or two people <laughs> and that they're musicians. So I'm a little, you know, like I, I, I wouldn't predict that I'm going to be like the next big, big thing in the film world because who knows? But uh, I, I'm very grateful for, for what I have. And I'm also interested in checking out scoring too. So it's been amazing talking to you. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, look forward to meeting up in person at some point. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for watching. So long, farewell. Have a good day and au revoir. Adios. Twizines. Ciao. Goodbye.